Sabbaton. Yeah, Sabbath again, church. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. I know it's not uh, none of us here today, but uh, the Bible tell, tells us that where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in their midst. We have um, our Pathfinder group, our Pathfinders and uh, the uh, leaders who are out camping today. So actually right after church, uh, I will be uh, leaving to go and join uh, them. So we won't be able to uh, stay for Portland today as I will be uh, going to uh, Mahomet to be with them. Uh, thank you for reading uh, the uh, scripture reading, uh, Sheva. For now, let us turn our Bibles to uh, Romans 5 uh, verse 8. And uh, that's uh, quite a familiar text. So Romans uh, 5 verse 8. And I'll read it uh, in your hearing. It says, uh, but God demonstrates his own love toward us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let us uh, consider for the next few moments a subject with the title Sermon on the Mount, part one. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we uh, thank you for uh, giving us one more time to read uh, from your word. I pray that you may uh, forgive me of my sins. May you... Uh, <clears throat> Hide me behind the shadows of the cross so that your people can see Jesus uh, this morning. And may we see Jesus and be drawn closer to him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So now we uh, continue our journey in Matthew. Uh, last time we finished uh, chapter 4. And uh, in those verses, Jesus was uh, calling the disciples, and uh, he was calling them to be our, our fishers of men. And then after that, we saw Jesus, uh, a great multitude coming to Jesus, and they had all kinds of sicknesses and diseases, but uh, Jesus healed them all. Um, now we uh, skip over to uh, 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 our focus for this uh, Sabbath is in chapter 5. Um, and chapter five begins, uh, by saying, and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain and when he had, he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them saying, right. uh, throughout, uh, the Bible, we have seen great prophets who did quite well in preaching the word of God, right? And uh, there was um, Elijah, there were prophets like Jonah, there was Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, right? All those did a great job in terms of preaching the word of God. And then when we move to the New Testament, we see John the Baptist getting on the scene and he was a great preacher as well. But as great as those were, none compares to Jesus. In this chapter, we are seeing Jesus himself doing the preaching. And I'm sure even uh, right now we have listened to some uh, great preachers of our day. You know, whether you mention uh, Dwight Nelson, you know, uh, Doug Butler, um, those are great preachers. C.D. Brooks. You know, um, uh, some, are, uh, of course, are his late, great preachers, but none compares to what we see in this chapter. In this chapter, Jesus himself is doing the preaching. So it makes sense for us to pay attention because Jesus himself is preaching. And Matthew, as we established earlier on, draws a parallel between Jesus and Moses. 
we saw Moses in the Old Testament uh, receiving the law from God. And in this uh, New Testament, uh, we are seeing Jesus doing the same thing. You know, uh, Jesus is uh, going over the law uh, in this sermon that we are going to uh, that we are going to look at. And the primary audience uh, that Jesus is preaching to are his disciples. Remember, he just uh, called the disciples in the previous chapter, chapter, and but not only are the disciples with him, there are other multitudes as well who are following him uh, and some who are seeking healing. So as Jesus is preaching, he's aware of his audience and his sermons are tailored towards uh, his uh, audience. The uh, first uh, 11 verses, from, from verse 3 to verse 11, the Bible records what are known as the Beatitudes, the blessings that are pronounced to people. Now, before we uh, get to those Beatitudes, let's take a look at uh, how things were during that day. The Jewish uh, were controlled by the Romans, and the Romans were not nice people. They were known as uh, uh, cruel masters. They were oppressing them. And the Jewish people were looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. And in their minds, the Messiah was going to free them from the Roman oppressors. So they looked forward to freedom coming with, um, um, with the coming of uh, the Messiah, right? So they were looking forward to a situation where they were going to live comfortable life, good lives. And you may equate this to the American dream. They were looking forward to a situation where they would not have to deal with uh, the uh, Roman oppression, where things would be good. And other writers say they were looking forward to a moment where they did not have just the one cloth or one clothing they wore, they didn't wear suits like we do. But even at the um, cloaks that they wore, there were some expensive ones that were worn by uh, the rulers. So the common people also looked forward to a day when they would be able to wear expensive clothing, where they would be able to do things without having to worry with the Roman emperor uh, about the Romans. So Jesus is now talking to this audience who have a distorted vision, a distorted expectation of who the Messiah was and what he was going to do. And sometimes I wonder, do we have the correct understanding of the gospel? Just like them, are we looking at the gospel with distorted minds? and sometimes selfish minds and lose focus of that which God wants to tell us. In their eyes, they were looking at people who were living in nice houses, maybe the Romans, as people who were blessed, as people who were recipients of God's blessings. And in these Beatitudes, Jesus is changing that narrative in terms of uh, who is truly blessed. Blessing cannot be counted based on the house that you live in. That's what Jesus is saying. In order for you to be blessed, that's not determined by the car that you drive. That's not determined by the job that you have. That's, determined, that's not determined by the title that you have the school that you have attended or not attended, Jesus is disputing that. He's bringing another paradigm and he's letting them know that in order for you to be blessed, anybody can be blessed, regardless of those things that we see and sometimes that we get consumed about. So that's where Jesus is um, um, uh, coming from and speaking on that, uh, Ellen White says, 
without combating their ideas of the kingdom of God. So we have said the background, the people have a distorted um, idea of the kingdom of God. So without combating their ideas of the kingdom of God, he told them the conditions of entrance therein, leaving them to draw their own conclusions as to its, its nature. The truths he taught are no less important to us than to the multitude that followed him. So what we see in these Beatitudes, the important truths that Jesus was teaching are still very important to us as we live uh, today. We know less than they need to learn the foundation principles of the kingdom of God. So as we go through these Beatitudes, these coming to church, our goal is to get it to the kingdom of God, right? And Jesus is letting us know what we need to do to get to that kingdom. Um, we just finished uh, giving, um, uh, I just finished giving me terms to my uh, students at ISU. And before I give uh, me terms, I have a study guide. And I tell my students, my goal is not to ambush them or to surprise them. If they pay attention to that study guide and use it to study, there won't be any surprises on the exam. So Jesus is telling people who want to make it to the kingdom that these are the things that you and I need to do in order to get to the kingdom of, uh, uh, kingdom of God. So let's take a look at them and see how we are doing personally. And if there are some areas that we need to change, let's uh, ask let's ask for God to give us the power to change so that we too can be counted among those who are blessed. The first beatitude is recorded in uh, uh, verse 3 of uh, Matthew 5. The Bible says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He's talking to people who are poor by their standards. And as the poor people, they are thinking that blessed are those who live in mansions. But Jesus is correcting that, that the actual blessing, there's a blessing in being poor, but not being, not poverty in material things, poverty in spirit. I'm sure in this uh, town, you have drove by and seen people who are begging people who are poor, people who are asking for assistance. What they are doing is they are extending, they are telling you that I'm in need of some food. I'm in need of some money, can you help me? Jesus is saying those who realize and recognize their condition that I am in need of the spirit of God. I need God's spirit, those people, are the ones that Jesus is saying they are blessed. Do you realize your poverty when it comes to the spirit of God? When you realize that you are poor, when it comes to the spirit of God, Jesus is saying, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. God will not leave you without your need unattended. God will attend to your spiritual poverty. Uh, he also says, blessed are those who hunger. Uh, these are not, um, uh, uh, these don't go um, right after the other ones, but uh, they are regarded as being similar. Uh, verse 6 says, blessed are those who hunger and thirsty for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Have you ever been in that situation where you are hungry? And the, uh, some people are having three meals a day. And in between, we have the snacks. We need food to replenish us. The hunger that Jesus is talking about, it's not being hungry for cereal. It's being hungry for righteousness, being hungry for the word of God. Jesus is saying, blessed are you when you have that hunger. Before you go into your kitchen every morning to get your breakfast, when you have hunger, for righteousness, it means you are seeking the word of God. You, you, you are wanting to feast 
from the word of God. Those are the people that Jesus is saying, blessed are you. When you are hungry for the word of God, when you cannot wait to dig into the word of God and to study what God says, Jesus is saying, blessed are you. Do you hunger for his word? We'll be having potluck uh, later here. And maybe it's just me. There are some Sabbaths when you feel like, you know what? We need to move a little bit quick so that we can eat because you are hungry. Jesus is talking about that agency, having it for the word of God, saying, you know what? I cannot wait to get into my morning devotion. I cannot wait to get into my evening devotion. Those are the people that Jesus is saying, blessed are you. Have you ever felt that thirsty and you drink that water and it quenches your thirsty? Jesus is saying, blessed are you when you thirsty to get, when you thirsty for righteousness. Speaking of those, uh, the servant of God says, the Lord can do nothing toward the recovery of men until convinced of his own weakness. Are you convinced about your own weakness? And stripped of all self-sufficiency, he yields himself to the control of God. When you yield yourself to the control of God, when you are in that state of poverty, that when you say, I have nothing, I have need, I am poor. When you get to that, the servant of God says, then he can receive the gift that God is waiting to bestow. There is a gift that God is willing to bestow. That can be yours as long as you get to the state of realizing your wretchedness, your nakedness, your, po your, your poverty. From the soul that feels this need, nothing is withheld. When you are like that beggar on the street who is saying, can you help me? When you go to Jesus and express your need, Jesus will not hold anything from you. So he's saying, blessed are you when you are poor. He has unrestricted. Did you hear that? He has unrestricted access to him in whom all fullness dwells. May God help us so that we may re realize our need of Jesus. May we not be like the church in Laodicea, which thinks that they are rich and let nothing. But when the reality is they are wretched, they are poor. Jesus says, blessed are the um, are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The next uh, beatitude, he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. He's talking about people who mourn at sin. People who see sin for what it truly is. We have gotten to a situation where we are no longer disturbed by sin. And we have come up with good names to name sin. Alternative lifestyle, adult entertainment, all that is sin. Jesus is saying, blessed are you when you are disturbed by the sin that goes on. When you mourn over your sins, not only your sin, but the sin around you, there is comfort for you. The servant of God says, we often sorrow because our evil deeds bring unpleasant consequences to ourselves. There are some times when we express sorrow, maybe because we have been caught, because we have People have seen the things that we don't want them to see. He said, but this is not repentance. Real sorrow for sin is the result of the working of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit reveals the ingratitude of the heart that has slighted and grieved the Savior and brings us in contrition to the foot of the cross. By every sin, listen to this, by every sin, Jesus is wounded afresh. Every time you sin, every time I lie, it may be a small lie, Jesus is wounded afresh. And that's 
that should disturb us, that we are causing pain to Jesus by our sins. When we grieve over our sin, when we realize the nature of sin, Jesus is saying, blessed are you when you mourn for comfort, uh, for you will be comforted. Um, she goes on to say, um, and as we look upon him whom we have pierced, we mourn for the sins that have brought anguish upon him. May God help us so that we are never comfortable with sin, but may we get disturbed and mourn over our sins. The next one is, uh, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Um, in this beatitude, Jesus is talking about the calmness and self-control. Ellen White says, the difficulties we have to encounter may be very much lessened by that meekness which hides itself in Christ. If we possess humility of our master, we shall rise above the slights, the rebuffs, the annoyances. How many of us deal with those in our lives? The annoyances. You, 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 it, it, it seems like uh, things around you are not working. The annoyances to which we are daily exposed and they will cease to cast a gloom over the spirit. She goes on to say the highest evidence of nobility is a Chris, in a Christian is self-control. May God help us so that we have this self-control. As I was reading this, I thought, you know what? Everybody might tune out in this sermon. Maybe this one is for me. I, I really need the things that Jesus is talking about here. That self-control, how many times do we feel the need to respond? How many times do we need the response to say something back? Jesus is saying, uh, Ellen White, based on Jesus, she's saying the highest evidence of nobility in a Christian is self-control. He who under abuse, can you hear that? You are getting abused. Uh, and, or cruel, cruelty fails to maintain a calm and trustful spirit robs God of his right to reveal in him his own perfection of character. When you are on the receiving end, when people are abusing you, when you remain calm, it sends a message that you know who God is. Lowliness of heart is the strength that gives victory to the follower of Christ. It is the token of their connection with the courts above. You are not consumed in the things that you can see. Yes, they can do whatever they want to do to you, but you know your connection with heaven. And that produces meekness in you. So Jesus is saying, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the kingdom of uh, heaven. So he's pronouncing blessings to these groups of people. And then he's also pronouncing promises. What shall become what are these uh, uh, people who inherit? The um, next ones, he says, uh, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. How are we doing with expressing compassion towards people who may not even deserve it? Are we merciful to those around us? He says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Speaking of um, um, purity, desire of age says, every impure thought defiles the soul. It impairs the moral sense and tends to obliterate the impressions of the Holy Spirit. Every impure thought dims the spiritual vision so that men cannot behold God. May God help us so that we can watch the things that we allow, that we entertain in our minds. May God help us so that we don't allow any impure thoughts to be in our minds as they um, uh, becloud us. The Lord may and does forgive the repenting sinner 
But though forgiven, the soul is marred. There is great danger in the things that we entertain in our thoughts. They can mar our souls. It says all impurity of speech or thought must be shunned by him who would have clear discernment of spiritual truth. How is our speech? Are we only saying things that are pure, that are clear, that are edifying? When we are at work, I'm sure all of us are in situations where people say all kinds of words. Are we joining in with them? Or as God's children, are we realizing that we have a responsibility to be pure even in our thoughts? Jesus saying, blessed are those who are pure in heart, for they shall see God. There is no greater honor than to see God himself. So those who are pure, who have the highest privilege of seeing God, I want to see God when he comes. Amen. But it means my mind has to be pure. My words have to be pure. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. I'm sure all of us will agree that this world needs peace. There is instability everywhere. Do we need to talk about what, you know what's happening in, uh, in Israel and Palestine, but we don't need to go to the foreign lands. Look at what's happening in this country. Can you believe it? We are living during a country where bipartisanship is no longer condoned. When you get punished for promoting bipartisanship, that's the divisiveness that we see in this country and the lack of unity. But God is calling us as Christians to be different, to be peacemakers at our job. And actually, we do need peace even in our homes. Our marriages are suffering. Our families are suffering. There is need for peacemakers beginning in our families. Peace in our church, peace in our country, peace in our world. Jesus is saying, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. Speaking of peace, Ellen White says, men cannot manufacture peace. Human plans for the purification and up uplifting of individuals or of society will fail of producing peace because they do not reach the heart. The only power that can create or perpetuate true peace is the grace of Christ. We do need the grace of Christ in order for us to have true peace in our homes, in order for us to have true peace in our families, in our church. When this is implanted in the heart, it will cast out the evil passions that cause strife and dissension. And there's a lot of strife and dissension that goes around. But as children of God, we can be different. And Jesus is saying, blessed are you if you are known as the peacemaker. On your job, let people know you, that when it comes to you, you... You, you, you tolerate everybody. You, 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 you entertain everybody. You are known as a peacemaker, not as someone who, is, uh, di, di, um, who promotes a, a disunity. The last one says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And actually verse uh, 11 and 12 goes into that. So, Jesus is talking to the disciples. He is very much aware that things are not, going, might, are not going to end well for them. You know how it ended for the disciples. They were persecuted, but not just the disciples. Look at the, early, uh, the, 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 the dark ages when Christians were being persecuted. And Jesus is saying, blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness sake. He is looking down through time. He's looking at people who are going to live just before he comes. And he realizes that some are going to be persecuted for standing up for what God says. Some are going to be persecuted for choosing to follow God's commandments, including the fourth commandment. 
Jesus is saying, blessed are you when you are persecuted for that. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So when persecution comes, we can, when we are persecuted, we can count that as a blessing. Jesus knew that uh, they would suffer and be disappointed and dis be discouraged, but he's encouraging them ahead of time that blessed are you when you are persecuted. Um, chapter five, in chapter five, Jesus goes on to talk about the salt of the earth and the light. That's what you and I are called to do. Not just peacemakers, but we are called to make a difference. Salt was known to preserve. That's what you and I should be. We are supposed to be the light of the world, but as lights, we borrow our light from Jesus, who is the light of the world. And as we go our ways, we are supposed to be illuminating. We are on our jobs. People are supposed to look up to us and things are supposed to be different as we become the light of the world. Then Jesus says, do not think that I came to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. He talks about heaven and earth moving, but not a judge from the law will be changed. And then after that, in that same chapter, he goes through these um, six um, contrasting statements, beginning with uh, murder, how people looked at murder. You know, we live during a time where people are so hateful. You look, you, you, you hate somebody based without even knowing them, based on how they look. When you do that, Jesus is saying you have murdered. May God help us so that we don't, we are free from hatred. We are free from hatred. Jesus talk, talked about adultery, okay. that you don't need to lie with somebody, to be in bed with somebody to commit adultery. By your thoughts, by looking at them, you can commit adultery. We are living during a day when we are looking at stuff on our mobile devices and committing murder on here, committing adultery on our phones. May God deliver us and free us from these things that will never be changed. He says in his word, the law of God is everlasting. It, it still binds. It still applies. He talked about marriage. The sanctity of marriage, not divorce. He says whoever divorces his wife for any reason other than sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. I know this can be a tough one in some situations, but it is the word of God. What Jesus said is clear. He talks about uh, forbidding the oath and then uh, going the extra mile. And then the very uh, last one that uh, he covers in that chapter is loving your enemies, loving the unlovable. We, 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 we love those who love us. That's the natural thing to do. We love our family members if they are good to us, if they are treating us well. But when they stop treating us well, Sometimes we cut that love. Jesus is bringing some, is telling us to do something different. He says, how different are you from the rest of the world if you only love those whom you love, th those who love you? And if you notice, everything that is in this chapter that Jesus is expecting you and I to do, he has already done. He's saying, doesn't our father cause his son to shine on the good and the evil. In Romans, where I read at the beginning, the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, God died for us. Amen. God did not wait for you to make things right with him in order to love you. He loved you and me while we were yet sinners. And he expects no less from you. So, as before I take my seat, perfection that we see in verse 48, he says, therefore, you shall be perfect just as your father in heaven is perfect. What is perfection? Perfection 
is loving that co-worker who hates you. Perfection is loving that person who doesn't like you. Praying for them. Fasting for them. Spending time pleading to God to bless them. That's perfection. And unless our righteousness passes that of Pharisees, unless we are perfect, we won't be able to see the kingdom of God. May God help us. I'm so glad. This is difficult. This is hard. But with God, all things are possible. May we look up to God to give us the strength in our own power. We cannot do these things. We cannot be peacemakers. We cannot be merciful. We can we will love our sins. We will murder. We will commit adultery. But by the power that God gives us, we can do all things. May God help us so that we may do that which he wants us to do. May God bless you. Amen. Can we stand for our closing song? Uh, in your bulletin, it says 430, but the song, the actual number in your hymn books are 428. We're going to do Sweet By and By.